smartphone data and how we use big data in the context of model um, uh, model inferencing as well. So um, here we're engaged in human activity recognition and HMMs are quite attractive ways of classifying underlying states that change over time. This was a small study. Um, I'm not going to go into some of the the really interesting background on this study, but basically we, we got a small number of participants to mark down over time what state they were, um, what state they were in with respect to certain postures and activities. So we actually, this is uh, an Ethica predecessor. Um, this is based on probably work in 2013, 14, something like that. Um, maybe, maybe it was 14, 15. And so we asked people to indicate on, on their uh, interface of their phone, where's the phone on your body? You know, is it breast pocket, uh, back pocket, um, uh, in your hand, um, uh, etc. Uh, on an external thing like uh, a handbag. What's your current posture? So sitting, standing, lying down, etc. Are you in a vehicle? Are you indoors or outdoors? And then any comments that they want to give. And people could start intervals and then stop intervals um, where this was true and switch to another situation. Also, um, uh, if, they, if the phone was off person, um, it would go into this state and they could say I'm picking up the phone and then there's a button here that would say going off person and so you could put down the phone or I want to put down the phone and you put it down. So the idea is we were measuring ground truth about the underlying state of these individuals over time. And uh, we did so for about 11 people in a um, ethics-reviewed uh, study. So here's the situation where it's off-person and then on-person they'd be asked to indicate uh, these various things. Um, and you'll notice for each one they could make uh, a set of choices um, for activities, um, for whether they're in a vehicle or not, indoor, outdoor, etc. Uh, and they could ignore data if they wanted to throw it away for quality reason, quality concerns, you know, quality uh, assurance concerns. There were a set of data we collected from this that included light levels, temperature levels, pressure, humidity, um, uh, aspects of the phone's uh, rotational um, movement, as well as its posture um, uh, and uh, accelerometer readings. Uh, and many of these were used in the analysis, particularly gyroscope and accelerometer data. And um, broadly speaking, we have different likelihood functions associated with or probability distributions that inspired likelihood functions associated with different states. So if, if the phone was off person, we tended to have very low rotational speed. Okay, the phone was unlikely to be varying a lot rotationally uh, in an off-person state. So this is a probability distribution, this is a density, and you can see the off-person, which is the red, con concentrates on the far left here. So if it's off-person, it's much more likely it has very low rotational speed. Mm -hmm. By contrast, if a person is sitting, there's, as you might expect, there's a modest level of rotational speed um, why? Well, a person might be moving slightly, might be road swiveling in their chair, um, uh, there's a certain amount of breathing going on, um, just sort of ambient movement. Maybe they're on a bus and it's moving around a little bit, right? Um, uh, if they are standing, there's a higher level of uh, of, of activity or of, of, of rotation that's going on. If they're standing, it's rare that you stand totally still. Uh, and so there's some measure of rotational movement. And you can see that that probability distribution accords with theory that it should have higher levels of rotation. And finally, if you're walking, well, as far as this graph is concerned, it's off the charts because this is very low levels of rotational movement. 
And what this suggested to us is that um, uh, that it was likely possible in principle to help tease apart these states. To tease apart, on the one hand, standing, from on the other hand, sitting. Yes, they're overlapped, but using a hidden Markov model approach, we know that overlap distributions are not per se a problem. Because with enough measurements, for example, if we got several measurements of 0.05 or something between 0.25 and 0.05 in a row, we might lend a lot more plausibility to standing versus walking. So the probability of, of getting these repeated measurements in this region is much higher for standing than it is for this uh, sitting, for example. And so by totaling up these measurements, we, um, uh, we could uh, we could total up um, a higher, with higher confidence um, the, um, the probability we're in a given state. So the idea here is that we had a set of states, the phone off person sitting, standing, or the person is walking. We excluded from this particular analysis lying down because we didn't have a lot of data on lying down postures. Maybe because, well, maybe we should have asked younger participants who used the phone even while prone um, or supine in some cases. Um, but um, you can imagine a transition matrix. These are just, just for show purposes. But we have these four states, and you can transition uh, between the states. Um, so you can go from standing to walking, for example, or from walking to sitting down, et cetera. And you could go from off person to multiple states. So over time, there were some hidden underlying situation, right? At any one time, they were in one posture. We just don't know what it is. And we're trying to infer that for small periods of time, OK? Um, and uh, so we're going to have observations for periods of time that are going to be incomplete, ambiguous, and so on. And we're going to try to infer what's going on. Are they sitting, standing, lying down, or walking? I, I, not lying down, excuse me. Sitting, standing, wa um, um, walking, or is it off person, right? Um, okay, um, so there's an underlying situation evolving over time, which we can't directly observe. We have data that's individually ambiguous um, as to um, what's going on. The underlying set of states are continuous. This is just well made for an HMM. And indeed, uh, we used an HMM to good effect with it. So we observed uh, multiple types of data, and we tried to infer. So here, what, any one measurement will be ambiguous, but as we start to total it up, we may find, OK, it's looking more and more likely like a standing case compared to a sitting case. OK. Um, OK. Um, OK, we, we actually ended up using simulation models in a really interesting way within this study. So um, one of the things we found is that we had data which violated hidden Markov model assumptions in that um, uh, if we knew the underlying ground truth situation, we're going to use it to train and test the model um, against different participants' data. Um, and one of the things we observed is that while someone was in a given state, the in, remember the assumptions for hidden Markov models posit that while you're in a given state, the measurements are independent. That if you're in a state of, say, sitting, the successive measurements of, of, of your um, behavior are, are independent, conditional on being in that state. It's not that all measurements are independent of one another temporally, far from it. It's just that while you're in the state, if you know you're in that state, those measurements are independent, conditional on being in that state. Um, you're, of course, more likely to stay in the state, and therefore measurements between different periods of time, if you don't condition on the state, are, are not independent. But conditional on being in a state, if they're assumed to be independent. We found that there was actually a high degree of formal correlation. It's not surprising at all, right? If I'm sitting, and I'm in a kind of fidgety mood, and I'm moving around, that's pretty average. <laughs> 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 then then it's, it's quite likely that in the next little bit of time, 
maybe one second interval, three second interval, 10 second interval, that I'll also be fidgety. Just ask Christine. Um, so, so there's a high autocorrelation involved. What we did is we used data from a simulation model to probe how much would this really throw off the analyses. So we used simulation generated data from a, from a simple agent-based model to plug in synthetic data to test how robust would the underlying HMM be it's coffee break. as we varied these assumptions. <laughs> Thanks, Christine. Thank you, Sophie. Much appreciated. Um, okay, so um, long story short, I'm standing between you and croissants. Um, uh, we, we had a, a predicted state, a ground truth state, um, and uh, could compare, since we had ground truth for each person, we trained the model on some subsets of the data, uh, and we then assessed it against actual ground truth data. And what we found is, is actually a, um, a very mixed story. So what we found is that, by and large, our measurements were not horrible. So for example, here's a standing interval we classified correctly as, as standing. Um, there's periods of, of sitting we classified as sitting. Um, same thing here, et cetera. Um, but there were periods that we were misclassified. And what we found is, um, for some of the participants, we seem to be misclassifying a great deal. And for some participants, we seem to be uh, better able to classify accurately. One of the things that, that uh, complicated this is um, the fact that we couldn't slice and dice this data in whatever way we wanted. Why? Because HMMs um, benefit from sequences of data, of successive observations. So it's not like we could readily take, you know, random subsets of this data and just use those to train the model and then test it on other random subsets. We want to achieve a degree of continuity, of, of, of taking sequences of data that were contiguous, that were kind of uh, coherent sequences. Um, and uh, we ended up doing that, but we found that there was a lot of mislabeling. Um, and when we looked at the data, um, we found that there were some odd features of it. So uh, this is uh, an example here. Um, so uh, here's off-person data and here's on-person data. This was labeled as being off-person. It was also labeled as being and, and, and uh, for cases where it was off vehicle as well, which I'm not positive this is off vehicle. But you'll notice an odd feature of this. Um, does anything strike you as odd about this off person data? Well, one thing that's odd is there's, this is a quite long axis, I think. Or no, no, it's not super long. But um, this is higher levels of movement. And we started to burrow in the data we started to find uh, mislabelings. Um, however, um, we did find that there was a subset of the data that seemed very, very um, consistent. Uh, and we started to look at data quality concerns. For example, if we looked at data that was labeled off-person and off-vehicle, and we asked what fraction showed motion, for for most participants, we had something like 16% showing significant motion. Um, but for one participant, it was uh, very, uh, very, very, very small levels of, of motion. We looked at autocorrelation, um, and we found actually that while we used HM, uh, simulation models to test what types of violations of HMM concerns would throw off the model, what we found is actually that the participant whose data seemed more consistent also had lower levels of autocorrelation. And so what we started to suspect was that mislabeling might be responsible for a lot of the autocorrelation we observed. Now you may wonder, why would mislabeling cause autocorrelation? Well, we're looking for autocorrelation within a given state, say off-person state. And 
if secretly within the things that they claimed were off person, there's periods of walking, and then there are periods of sitting, and then there are periods where it was genuinely off person. You might expect a lot of, off, of, of autocorrelation because the things that are for period of walking will be, tend to be very correlated with each other in terms of having higher levels of activation um, uh, compared to the things that are, that are you know, in the off person state uh, later. And so there'll be periods of high autocorrelation in there because there's different states going through it um, that, are, that are taking place. So the high autocorrelation suggested uh, mislabeling. So we created a fake data set with autocorrelation removed. Um, and we did a lot of this using a combination of kind of data scrambling and simulation data. And, um, and in this case, we found the autocorrelation. Um, if, we, if we scrambled the data and, and um, uh, and used it absent the autocorrelation, the results became uh, fairly uh, much, much improved. Um, so uh, here, um, uh, with uh, the subset of the data that seemed to be highly, uh, high, high reliability, what we found is we could actually quite accurately classify different, um, uh, different uh, states that a person was in. We used this construct called an F1 score, which kind of generalizes um, uh, classification ability uh, beyond sensitivity and specificity for the cases of multiple different categories of, of, of outcomes, and not just dichotomous ones, yes or no, as is classic with, um, uh, with sensitivity and specificity, but other categories as well. So for different states, for example, um, uh, what we found is uh, we could classify um, with respect to, excuse me, different, ca uh, different classifications. So on and off person, 82% um, or, or 0.82. Off stance, uh, sitting, standing, and walking, 0.79. And on or off this vehicle, 0 0.74. These are considered quite decent uh, F1 scores. Um, and uh, we, we performed them in, in two different ways. This is with kernel density estimation, and this was with, uh, uh, to estimate the, uh, the likelihood functions, and this was a, um, uh, a parametric approach for likelihood functions. Um, these are the overall results across all participants, much less good for participant one, uh, very solid results. Um, uh, okay, so, Another thing we ran into is state dwell times um, uh, that did not seem uh, exponentially distributed. Um, and uh, here we ended up, uh, as I recall, using a simulation model to, to test that. Um, so uh, here we were able to look at um, some aspects of data quality that le led us to suspect mislabeling. Um, once we took into account mislabeling, uh, mislabeling and uh, sort of sorting through the, uh, the different types of data with an eye towards quality, it seemed that the HMM could actually be quite promising for distinguishing different states. But fundamentally, we need more uh, high quality data. Um, it did seem that the underlying Markov chain was uh, effective in providing temporal context. Um, uh, one thing I will tell us, uh, I will say is that this study suggested that for ground truth recording, for asking people to record, is it off person, is it on person, are you in a vehicle, are you off of a vehicle, what type of activity you engage, it requires a lot of incentives for high quality, double checks, asking people what's the quality of their classifications. And we did some of that, but we needed to have done more. Um, to ask people what, what sort of care did you take? Because it became clear some of the participants seemed to have taken very little care. They used it to generate a bit of money from compensation for the study. Others took great care. And it would be nice to consider some sort of uh, less onerous means of recording ground truth data uh, of this sort. Um, okay, that's all I have time to, to talk about here, but this was hidden Markov models. Um, being used to infer activity data, which seemed to be quite successful with high quality data, but um, 
with data as a whole for our participants because of labeling challenges, um, it didn't tend to work so well, likely because of, of data quality issues. This is a use of hidden Markov models. Uh, we will be having another lecture uh, by Chen Yang here, um, who will be presenting on uh, smoking and classifying smoking behavior, periods of smoking behavior, using hidden Markov models after the break. Okay? Thank you very much. And we'll uh, have a 10-minute have a break right now, and we'll reconvene with the new generation. Can you go one slide, a slide that you have hidden markup with nine pages? Uh, this one? Um, I saw that. I saw that. <laughs> the slide with, um, you have a corner of nine pages. Oh, yes. Yeah. Minus something. Uh, it's a green color. Yeah. 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 Is that H and M minus nine bay? What, what it's so so we used um, okay, um, I, I think the basic idea here is that um, we wanted to evaluate how well an HMM could classify uh, as a method and how well naive base approach could apply. Now the naive base approach was used here at any given time we fed it the measurements and we asked it are they sitting or standing or whatever. The difference of that and HMMs is that the HMM takes into account temporal context. It takes into account the fact that your measurement, your situation now is not totally independent of your situation 30 seconds ago or 15 seconds ago. So what HMMs give us here is a recognition. They allow us to capture the fact that that you don't like jump up and sit down and run and sit down all within a 10 second interval, generally. There's a temporal continuity. And one of the things that I'm, I'm missing here um, which I, I really wanted to mention is I was trying to mention how long this time interval was. I think it was maybe one second intervals or something. And, and naive Bayes... It naive way, I mean, theoretically, would work well for the classification because this seems like the behavior of the data is like Gaussian distribution. And that isn't that, isn't that like... Like well, it's actually, this is actually just an uh, illustrative example. Oh, okay. It's actually, this is not what it looks like. Okay. But um, Naive Bayes would independently classify this, like using the data just from that, and independently classify yeah. that, without taking into account the temporal regularities. That's true. Um, whereas the HMM took into account the fact that if you were in a state previously, you have a higher likelihood of being in that state still, because you're unlikely to be going quickly, super quickly between states. So the idea here is, look, um, HMMs are quite similar in some ways to Bayesian, uh, to a naive Bayes method, but um, but it takes into account the temporal change and the evolution over time. And the performance that we get out of HMMs, if we consider naive Bayes performance for classifying, in a way, the difference between the two is reflective of the value of capturing this temporal context. The idea. In other words, if we get a lot better results out of HMM yeah. compared to naive base, a lot of that is probably attributable to the fact that we're capturing change over time. If you see what I'm saying. Yeah. So here, um, yeah, yeah. Well, HMMs are are uh, an example, very well formulated with Bayesian approaches. Yeah. Um, just like um, particle filtering. Yeah, I like the method because it's very, it's graphical, like, like yeah. we can see the interaction or the transitions, right. so it, it, it just makes sense when I think of that. I, I agree with that. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Very, very desirable. <laughs>
Yeah. 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 Yeah.